It's an Hi everyone, welcome to our second naturalist night. My name is Michael Messina and I work here as a winter naturalist and I, it's my pleasure to welcome you all here. Uh, I get to work and lead snowshoe tours out on Aspen Mountain and at Snowmass, which is a really cool job and it's part of what we do here at ACES. We're a big environmental organization. Environmental education is our specialty. And a part of that environmental education is presenting these naturalist nights, which are a free speaker series hosted every week from January to about mid-March. Uh, we host it twice a week, once in Carbondale, about 5.30 on Wednesdays, and then here at ACES at 7 o'clock on Thursdays. And these are brought to you in partnership uh, with ACES, uh, the Roaring Fork Audubon, and the Wilderness Workshop. And so now I'd like to take a moment to thank all of our sponsors that make this possible. Without them, we wouldn't be able to put these together, and I'd like to give a special shout out to our featured sponsor for tonight, which is Reese Henry Accounting. Um, also, if this is the only naturalist night that you can get to in person, that's okay. We air these every week on Grassroots TV, on channel 12 down va or up valley, excuse me, and channel 82 down valley. Also, if you can't watch it live at that point, these will be on the ACES website or YouTube channel afterwards for you to view at your own leisure. Um, so then next week's presentation is going to be Melanie Armstrong, and her presentation is going to be Nature Should Be Free, Public Claims to the Public Lands in the 21st Century, which should be a very <coughs> interesting topic and a very uh, timely topic, topic as well. But we're not here for that tonight. Tonight we're here to hear about the osprey, the ultimate fisher, the osprey, and I'm here to introduce Jasmine Finks. Uh, she got interested in ospreys, at a, or she got interested in birds at a very young age. Her parents wouldn't let her have a dog or a pet, so <laughs> she got interested in birding and went out and looked for birds. And that continued throughout her life um, until about six years ago when she found an osprey cam and saw ospreys for the first time in action and realized just how cool they are and decided to dedicate her work and studies to that. So now she's getting her master's of science at the University of Colorado in Denver, and she also works for the uh, Boulder County Parks and Open Space Osprey Camera, where she moderates the forum and creates an open community and a welcoming community to that all just loves ospreys and can enjoy the awesomeness that is the osprey. And without further ado, here's Jasmine. Thank you everyone for coming and embracing the cold. Um, we're here to talk about osprey. Let me get the, my presentation up. <laughs> There's something behind it. <laughs> Which one? This, this right here? Oh, it's because the blue light, I guess. The yeah. All right. That's more better. <laughs> All right. So who in here knows what an osprey is? Right? Who's seen an osprey? All right, majority. So we're in the right house, aren't we? <laughs> so hopefully you guys learned something about osprey today. Um, my presentation is all about why the osprey is the ultimate fisher. And our agenda this evening, we're going to start out with identification, then go into classification and habitat. And then we're going to go on to some cool adaptations that the osprey have to become the ultimate fisher. And then go through a life cycle from hatch to fledge, and then future of ospreys, and then we'll have a Q&A session at the end of the talk. So first, we're going to start with identification. So since most of you guys know what an osprey look like, this will kind of be a review. Osprey are found in Colorado in the spring to the fall every year. And what they do is they have their babies here. They migrate from either Central or South America to Colorado, and have their babies, and then they fledge them, and then they could go back to their wintering grounds in the winter. So we can identify an osprey by their brown stripe on their eyes. They, adults have yellow eyes. They have a white breast, belly, and armpits. Little armpits right here. What do they call those pits? Uh, they have long, narrow wi wings, and if you're looking up at the sky, they, they actually go in an N, N shape, and they have long, white legs. Some more identification tips. As we all know, there's a lot of cams that are popping up all over the state. There's uh, two in Summit County, I, I believe, and one in Boulder County. Uh, so if I refer to Boulder County, that's, I'm talking about the cam. 
Uh, so when a female and a male are next to each other, the females are a third larger than the males are. And scientists think that is because the females have to, 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 to defend the nest, and the males have to be smaller and more agile to catch the fish during nesting season. Uh, there's always exceptions, though. I've seen smaller, ma uh, smaller females and larger males. So osprey I like to keep us guessing. Wingspan. So this is a big thing. If you look at the eagle versus the osprey, I always say the osprey is all wing. They have huge wingspans in comparison to their bodies. So a wingspan of an osprey is like five to six and a half feet compared to their weight of three to 4.4 pounds. Compared to an eagle, the eagles almost double the weight of an osprey but have like a seven foot wingspan, six to seven foot wingspan. Now I put this picture here for a reason. So when we're watching nest cams, there's skills that we can develop to identify an osprey. So this is the back of the head of our male for Boulder County. And as you can tell, there's a specific pattern on the back of his head. And so it's kind of like a tigers have specific identifiers. Osprey have specific <laughs> identifiers on the back of their head. Um, this guy in particular, I always say that there's like a dancing woman on the back of his, on the back of his head, right? You guys see that? Um, so once ident you identify and you can, uh, you, can uh, you identify a male or a female, that's going to be the way that you do it. That's a surefire way. They're all different. They're all different. Another way is if the cam has a good zoom lens. There's, oops, I, I pressed the wrong button. Um, sorry, <laughs> there we go. Um, there's eye specs, <coughs> see? So eye specs are also a, a surefire way to identify osprey from one another. There is a thing going around like, uh, how do I explain this? where females have necklaces and males don't. I don't always go by that just because I've seen females without necklaces and I've seen males with a big necklace. The 100% way to identify an osprey is through a blood test through sex to see if they're male or female, but you can always make a guesstimate by the size. Size. Mm -hmm. So who in here knows what an osprey sounds like? Not too many of you guys, so this will, this will be fun. Uh, so osprey sounds are, they sound like a high-pitched uh, honk, chirp, or whistle. And there's a couple sounds that they do all the time. There's an intruder alert. Intruder alert means uh, osprey is on a nest, and if a neighbor osprey comes into their area, and they're going to make a chirping sound, saying, hey, you are in my area. This is my territory. An alarm call is basically when an osprey an intruder osprey gets way too close and they're on alert, they're in attack mode, it's a different sound. Sky dancing, sky dancing is basically a, a mating dance. So the, os the male osprey will either have a fish or a stick or something, he'll fly way up and then he'll fly way down, making really loud chirps for the female to kind of show off. Food call and food begging. These are different. Uh, food call is when the male already has a fish and he's fished out and he's coming back to the nest, the, the female's like, oh, please give me the fish, please give me the fish. Uh, food begging is basically her, like a, a chick or a female saying, hey, please go get me food. <laughs> We're hungry. <laughs> and then soft chirps, which we may hear in a couple videos where females are talking to their chicks or kind of chirping. So I'm actually gonna go to a website and we're gonna hear two calls from an osprey and then I'll describe which ones they are. I do have to get out of my presentation though. All right. So this is the first call. So you can kind of hear it's a combination of whistles and chirps. This is the alarm call. This is when something is way too close to them and they are alarming. Not too fierce, but it's all right. <laughs> it works. The second call. This call is when the male has a fish and is coming to the nest. 
So, and if you watch osprey cams a lot, you'll kind of identify all of these calls and you'll know exactly what's happening on the nest even though you're not watching. [laughs] So [laughs] all right, so that was kind of fun. Let's go back to the presentation. Oh, I did it from the beginning. Yeah. My fault. Sorry, guys. Slide that down. [laughs] So, the next thing I'm going to talk about is classification. So, osprey are unlike any other raptor in the world today. They are in their own genus and they have their own species. So they're not like a hawk they're not like a owl or they're not like a falcon or an eagle. So, the genus is Pandion and the species is Pandion helicoptera. Excuse me. [noise] And within the species there's four subspecies and these subspecies can be found on earth today. There are two that are extinct. Um, I'm not going to go over that. But we'll just uh, focus on the classification here. So, the first one is the the ones we can find in North America. This one, these are called Pandion helicoptera carolinensis. Uh, they are larger. They're darker brown. Uh, they're mainly migratory and they have a pale breast. What mainly migratory means is in warmer temperatures such as Florida or Mexico or southern California these guys will stay there year round. They're not migratory. But the ones we find in Canada, here in Colarado and even Washington or or Hog Island these guys will migrate to central and south America um, in the winter. The next subspecies is Pandion helicoptera caliatus. Uh, these guys are found in the Palearctic region which is Europe and northern Afri- northern Africa and northern Asia. Um, and these guys have a very dark breast and they are also mainly migratory. Seeing, um, you can see these year round in the Red Sea. Those guys don't migrate. Uh, darker breasts, I do want to touch base on this. Most of the males and females have the necklace. So that's why I don't think the breast feathers are a sure way to tell the sex. Um, the next classification is the Ridgeway and they are found in the Caribbean islands. These guys don't migrate. And this is a picture of one and he has a very white head. So a little different than what we're gonna see normally here. Uh, the eastern osprey is this picture over here. Uh, they are called the eastern osprey cuz scientists are arguing if they are a different species or or not but as of right now they're still a subspecies. They are smaller and non-migratory and they're they're found on the Australian coastline. So just basic information uh on the couple things. The next thing I want to talk about is habitat. So, I already talked about some of the areas you can find different osprey in. But osprey are found on every single continent except for Antarctica. You can tell the non-breeding resident and and breeding areas on this map. Um, I will mention that migrant populations vary more and they actually are are greater than the non-migrants. And why that is is because the resources. If you're in the Car- Caribbean islands, there's only so much fish that can sustain osprey. Right? Um, so that's pretty much way the wor- you can find osprey. Habitat, um, we all know where osprey live. Right? I always call them the real estate invest- the best real estate investors. They always choose waterfront property. Right? [laughs] And uh, you can find them near lakes, rivers, marshes or even lagoons and in the ocean. Uh, diet of an osprey is ninety nine point nine percent fish. You will rarely ever see them eat anything but fish. They eat salt water and fresh water fish. And uh, you you may see them with a mammal or a snake but that's only with fish that's not around. That's point zero one percent. Um, so in the upcoming video, I wanna talk about two things. They are, um, they they use two methods to hunt for fish. They use the dry method and the wet method. So the dry method is if you've seen an eagle fishing it's the same way. They use their talons and they just fly along the water and they pick up the fish. They scoop it up. So, not too exciting. But still they can catch a lot of fish that way. They can catch more fish if they're in in the fish swallows. Um, the second method is the wet method. So, what this is is osprey will have their talons out, head down, wings back 
and they dive up to three feet down into the water on top of a fish, grab the fish, and try to get airborne immediately. And we will watch a video with both of these methods. Some of my favorite videos. He got a lot of fish that time, right? <laughs> pretty cool and they can actually dive from 30 meters in the air and they can reach speeds to 20 to 50 miles per hour <laughs> gotta shake off the excess water there's one more this is a back shot How many of you have ever seen an osprey dive? Per that's pretty amazing. That's a big one, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Back to the nesty goes, right? <laughs> so this kind of leads into why an osprey can do this, right? They must have some special gear. Um, so we're going to talk about some of the adaptations that osprey have in order for them to be the ultimate fishers. So we're first gonna start out with the eyes. And you know, he's very, he's 30 meters in the air and he can see a fish underwater. So that takes some pretty good eyesight, right? I know I can't see past my past six feet. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, so the eyes are a good adaptation for um, osprey. Who knows what this is? Does anyone know? Yep, nictitating membrane, good job. And what this does is it protects their eyes. If an osprey's diving in the water, maybe there's some debris, they're gonna put the nictitating membrane down to protect their eyes. Um, and most raptors do have this, I wanna say that. But osprey use it for diving or even cleaning their eyes out. Anytime their eyes are in danger, they're gonna put that down. And they come in opaque to clear. Uh, another thing is that if you've ever seen an osprey go side to side, right, their head side to side, maybe going like this, looking at something, they're actually triangulating. They're measuring how far and how deep the fish is or however, they're measuring where they're looking at. So they, they know exactly where to pounce, where to hand. Mm -hmm. The next adaptation I wanna talk about is their beak. So as you can see here, uh, they have a different nostril than any other, uh, any other raptor. Most raptors have round nostrils. The osprey have slits. And what the slits do is when they're diving into the water, they close them. They can close them 
so the water doesn't get into their nose. Uh, they also have a shorter and more hooked beak than other, uh, than other raptors, and that's in order to tear into the fish. The next thing I'm talking about is wings. Uh, I mentioned before they have a really, really big wingspan. Uh, this is because osprey can actually carry up to two times their weight. Now, are they going to do that every time they catch a fish? No. Their average fish catch is about less than a pound, and they measure from 6 to 13 inches. Uh, I think the record on file is 2.5 pounds, but we don't measure every single fish that they catch, and I'm not taking a fish away from an osprey. <laughs> <laughs> I, I agree with you there. I do think that's bigger. <laughs> Uh, next adaptation are their feathers. So uh, um, osprey feathers are thick, and when they dive, they tighten them around their body so no water can get in between their feathers. Uh, compared to an owl, an owl has really fluffy, light feathers. You don't want an owl to get wet. <laughs> They'll get drenched, right? Osprey feathers are almost waterproof. So they have what's called an oil, or oil gland or preen gland, and what they use that for is it secretes oil. They take the beak and distribute all the oil on their feathers. And that makes them waterproof to a certain extent. Um, and then also it repels parasites. I also think they have the most prettiest feathers, but I'm kind of biased. <laughs> now comes my favorite part, the osprey feet, right? So this is my favorite part of, of why they are the ultimate fish oh, fisher. Uh, osprey feet have to be specialized, right? Or they couldn't catch fish. So we'll start with the toes. Osprey toes are all the same length. Uh, compared to other raptors, you can see in this picture here, uh, they're all different sizes. Uh, they have scales, it kind of looks like scales on their feet and their legs for grip. And then their talons, their talons are perfectly round. Unlike, let's just say the harpy eagle, you can kind of see the groove in the back on the hollocks right there, uh, the back hollocks. And most raptors have a groove in their, in their, um, their talons. Ospreys do not. They're perfectly round. I kind of like to think of them as fish hooks. <laughs> Continuing on the feet, I chose these two pictures on purpose to show off one of my favorite things about osprey is the zygodactyl. So on one of the pictures, you can see that there's one talon in the back, three talons in the front, and then the second picture here, there's two talons in the front and two talons in the back. Mm -hmm. So what the, it's called a zygodactyl, da dactyl, and this toe right here is a reversible outer toe. And what that's used for is we saw in the video, they want the fish to be aerodynamically with them, so the head is facing forward. So they use the zygodactyl to actually um, position the fish so they can fly with it. Because who wants to fly home with a floppy fish? <laughs> Nobody, right? <laughs> um, anyway, so that's a pretty cool thing. And then if you look closely here, there's little barbs. And those are called spicules. Spicules are used to grip the slippery fish. We all have had a fish kind of slip out of our hands, right? But an osprey, they're built to not be. <laughs> all right, so that kind of wraps up adaptation. I want to go through a life cycle. So again, as I said before, the, the cams are really popular nowadays. So I wanted to highlight every week of, of chick's life and see what you can expect and um, what we can see on cam. And there are some videos as well. So let's first start out with the nest. So the nests, as we all have seen, are huge, right? They're humongous. Um, osprey prefer open areas, and that's because they have such big wings. If you've ever seen an osprey land in a tree, it's not too graceful. It takes them a couple tries. It's because they're, they're not proportionate. The wings are so big. And then osprey are said to be more bonded to their nests than their mates. And what that means is, say a male and a female are constantly together and they, they've raised successful um, clutches year to year, and one of the female or the male passes away. What the, the other osprey, the single osprey will do is wait at the nest for another mate to arrive. So they're more bonded to their nest than other ones. Um, they can weigh a lot. I think the record was almost a ton. They just keep building up and up and up. 
So at the beginning of March, middle of March, sometimes end of March, depending on the elevation, higher elevations, ospreys tend to take a little longer to come back um, because of the snow melt off and et cetera. So the male and female show up, they start to rebuild the nest and they start to bond together. So the male will bring fish to the female from, from both of them starting there. Uh, bonding occurs frequently, mating will occur also frequently, but more frequently when the female is ovulating to ensure that the eggs are fertilized. This is a picture of the Boulder County nest cam. These guys have been together for over 10 years and, and the male is actually feeding the female. So they have a very strong bond. Next is egg laying. And as you can tell, osprey eggs, this is actually a replica. Um, they lay their eggs one to three days apart and they're a little bigger than a jumbo chicken egg and they have speckles on them. Uh, and they come in all sorts of different colors as you could tell on the slide here. This year I, I joked around and said, oh, the female ran out of ink, that's why number four is the lightest. <laughs> and uh, average clutch size is one to three eggs, four eggs being rare about 1% of the time. The longer the two offspring have been together, the more successful they are and that's why we have four eggs usually every year. Compared to a new couple, they're probably gonna have one to two. Okay. So I actually have a video, and this is of uh, the uh, boulder osprey laying an egg. And if everyone wants to be quiet, you might hear what sounds she makes. I might skip over a little bit. We, s we heard the little S, we call them little grunts. <laughs> and that's when the egg's coming down the egg shaft and she's actually having contractions. Mm -hmm. And you can kind of see her contractions as well. So I just thought that was pretty cool. I wanted to share it with you guys because you don't see that every day. <laughs> what's the percent of time that they're normally used to? Um, we'll get to questions right at, we'll, we'll do questions at the, no, that's okay, thank you, thank you. Um, so the next thing is incubation. So after the na eggs are all laid, the female will begin to incubate. There are times where the female will delay incubation, and I always say my motto is trust the osprey. Even though there's an egg in the, in the nest, she knows what she's doing, even though she's not laying on it all the time. She's not sitting on it all the time. If there is delayed incubation, they're not gonna hatch in the order that they were laid. They're probably gonna hatch three, two, one, four, or two, three, four, one, so. It just depends when she starts to actually incubate around the clock. <coughs> Eggs have to be at a constant temperature and constant humidity. She knows what she's doing. I just, we just <coughs> let her go, right? Um, both male and female will incubate. Mostly the female, they actually develop a brood patch that's right here that's featherless, and the eggs will actually be against that to keep warm. Um, you can also see the osprey turning the eggs constantly. And, and actually digging into the next cup, and that's irrigation, you know, if there's wetness around because of humidity. And also, if you know about chickens, chickens can stick to the side of an egg if it's not properly rolled. And that can happen with an osprey as well. The next thing is, uh, I think this is the second um, most exciting part is hatching. And it's waiting for these little babies to come forth. So 37 days later, we're gonna see some osprey chicks. Uh, chicks have a little egg tooth. You can see that little white on the, on the beak. And the egg tooth is used to make a pip right there. 
So a pip is usually star-shaped in the egg, and the, what the chicks will do is they will make it like a can opener as soon as they, <laughs> they pip out, and they'll cut around the egg and push themselves out. Uh, and it's an anxious time for both a mom and any of the cam watchers because we're waiting for babies. She's waiting for babies. You can actually, if it's a really good microphone, you can hear the chicks make sound before they're out of the egg. And the mom is always listening. So every time on the nest cam that the mom gets up, we're always looking for a pip, and so is she. So um, I will note that osprey eyes will change four colors in their lifetime. And when they are first hatched, they are color blue. And here is a video of a hatching. Pretty quick. The chick is the usually the wet one that's come out. That's the other baby, but this one, oh, there he goes. So that's a little hatching right there. <laughs> it's always a precious, precious time when you get to see moments like this. <laughs> and that's our female from Boulder County. All right, so we'll stop it there. <laughs> <Thank you>. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so now we're gonna go into the weeks and what we can expect. So at one week old, the chicks are growing super fast. If you look in this first picture here, you can see the egg and you can see the size of the chicks. They've doubled to triple the size. They eat every, sing every couple of hours. Um, unfortunately, there are bonking that can happen. That's just because they're a bird of prey. The strongest is gonna f survive. Um, we call it bonking. It's just kind of a nest term. I'm gonna use some nest terms that the nest watchers have made up, but they're not really official terms. But bonking is when the older chick will peck at the head of a younger chick in order to be first fed. So, <laughs> and you can see this is the, probably the first chick that hatched, and this is the last chick, and the size is very noticeable. They hatch, uh, they're laid on different days, and they hatch on different days, and that's because of survival of the fittest. Um, you can see some camouflage going on, the white strip and the black or brown edges. That's to look like nesting material. This is a feeding I wanted to show you guys. I'm going to skip over real quick. And the female will always feed the chicks with the mouth open. That's just what her instincts tell her to do. And this is the soft chirping that I was talking about. She will soft chirp to her baby. I think they're super cute at this age. <laughs> She'll tear the fish with her beak and feed it in very small pieces. Lots of patience, huh? <laughs> They're very hungry at this age. Every couple of hours they eat. All right, I'll stop it here. <laughs> we like to call them bobbleheads. It's kind of just like a, a little term because we think their heads are too big and they go always bobble, bobble around. <laughs> so the next week of life, they change drastically. <laughs> As you can tell, two weeks old, uh, they will double to triple their size again. Uh, Alan Poole, which is a famous ornithologist, he calls this the reptilian phase. They kind of look scaly, right? and they kind of look uh, meaner than they, they did a week ago. <laughs> um, 
the reptilian phase, uh, their eyes will turn another color, which is am amber brown. Uh, and then in, right after they hatch, their eyes are blue. And then like a couple days later, they turn black. Um, if I can say, I'm sorry. Uh, then their eyes turn amber during this week. Chicks will be rambunctious and come out of the nest cup. And there is siblicide that can occur at this age from two to five weeks is when that can happen. And what siblicide is, is the bigger chick doesn't let the younger chicks eat. And that's if there's not enough food or circumstances that are happening that are out of c our control. And again, these are birds of prey. They wanna make sure that their species are continuing and how they do that is survival of the fittest. So nature can be cruel sometimes, but hey, it's, this is the way we watch osprey, right? It's the osprey way, that's what I say. So I wanted to show you guys a video of a crop. So during the second week of life, the crop actually um, gets to be a crop. So a crop is a pouch right here. You can tell right here. And they store a ton of fish in that. Um, so they gorge themselves and they eat a lot, a lot, a lot. Um, and then they digest the fish slowly. So I just want to show you, these are really big crops. <laughs> we call them monster crops. But that's because there's a lot of fish that are being brought in. Um, when a crop is empty, you will know, and the chicks will actually be more aggressive. So at three weeks old, uh, chicks will, again, they're continuing to grow. The male will continue to bring in the fish for the whole family. Uh, juvenile pin feathers can be seen. They have buff tips, so they're brown with buff tips, so we can see the buff tips peeking in. Um, they have a white stripe that looks like stick on the back of their back. Um, and then they can also learn what's called thanatosis. Thanatosis um, is a defense mechanism. So say the, the female or male is alerting and alarm calling, they will actually pancake. We call them pancake, but they really lie flat on the nest to act like they're dead um, and to try to blend into the nest as much as possible. And I actually have a video of thanatosis that's pretty good here. Oh, not four weeks yet. There they go. <laughs> so that's thanatosis in a, in a nutshell. <laughs> These are older than three weeks. These are about five to six. So they can learn it. <laughs> All right. Pretty cool things we're learning today, huh? So at four weeks old, pen feathers are still growing. They're still growing at huge they, they absorb a huge amount of fish. Um, I wanted to show some pin feathers that are growing. So these are on the tail. And um, the sheath is what the, comes out of their body and the feather is inside of it. Uh, the, you'll see the, the osprey picking and preening at their feathers all the time. I, I'm sure it's itchy to have those things on. Um, they look kind of uncomfortable at this stage, but they're gonna get through it. They're trying to get their adult feathers. Um, and that's kind of what a pin feather looks like. If there is ringing or banding, which we don't do in Colorado, but they do in other states, they can start at four weeks old, um, then they can go to about six weeks. Um, and, and what banding is, is their little things putting on, put on their legs, and you just track them. You, not tracking all the time, but say that they um, survive and come back to the nest, um, as juveniles or young adults, and they have one of those bands, it has a number on them, and we can identify them and see where they've come from and know that they have survived. Uh, we can see chicks looking at their surroundings and imprinting on the area. Um, sometimes chicks will pass a pellet 
or a casing, whatever you want to call it. And what that is, is undigestible material from a fish. Uh, most likely, uh, osprey don't do this a lot because they digest all of the bones in the fish. But there are some things that they can't digest, like the gill. Gill flaps, they're pretty hard. Um, they'll spin them back up if they can't digest them. So I wanted to show you guys the osprey growth rate chart. So on around 30 days, the male and the female chicks reach their fastest growing point. So they're going to be consuming the most fish at this time. Uh, and then you'll see a, a kind of a cutoff. The female chicks will continue to grow, and the male chicks will slow their growth rates because males are smaller. Five weeks old, the chicks have reached their fastest growth rate, like I told you guys. Um, we could start to see the chicks actually standing on their feet and trying to walk around the nest. It takes some practice. They're a little wobbly at first, but they'll get it. Necklaces can be seen and pop up at this time. Um, and then chicks may start to flap their wings. We have a little nest term called winger sizing. You know, they just, they exercise their wings because in a couple weeks they're gonna have to fledge the nest and they build the strength up. Um, Again, older chicks will still be eating first, followed by younger chicks. And, and I know that I'm one of the ones that always root for the younger one. So that's kind of a, a given when you're watching these nest cams. At six weeks old, they're looking more like osprey every single day. Um, we can see self-feeding at this time. Most of the feeding has come from the female at, and distributing the food. But when self-feeding starts to occur, it's one fish per osprey. So the male will have to catch one fish per osprey. Well, you may see these chicks start to triangulate from time to time as well. At seven weeks old, the average fledge age, what fledge means is they first venture out and fly from the nest. Uh, seven weeks old, seven to eight and a half weeks old, this is their average time they will try to learn to control their wings. So when it's windy out, you're gonna see a video in the next slide where they start to hover and they start to control their flight. Osprey don't really branch. So eagles will jump to a branch before they fledge. Osprey don't do that because they have just an op just a nest. They just, they just fly. So it takes some guts, right? Male, male uh, will look, usually fledge first because they are smaller compared to females. Here's a video. Let's skip over. Well, click. There we go. <laughs> He's landing on his sibling, yeah. <laughs> He's not ready to go yet, so he's holding on. <laughs> Practicing. Winger sizing, right? It's the wind. 
<laughs> yeah, it's the wind. Mm -hmm. So it takes practice to fly, right? <laughs> All right. So at eight weeks old, if they haven't fledged the nest yet, they're going to do it sometime within this week or the end of the week. Uh, the parents will continue to provide for the chicks and bring fish to the nest for the, the remaining of their days at the nest. Um, chicks will continue to come back to the nest to eat and sleep. Sometimes they'll sleep off the nest. It depends on how um, adventurous the chick feels like. Um, and then at this eight weeks, they will be very vocal. They're going to be calling out to the male for fish. They're going to be defending the nest for themselves. Uh, they're they're going to be owning their nest. This is their nest. So you can see some territory fights sometimes, which are pretty exciting at this point in stage because you don't always see an osprey on the cam. You're always going to uh, be excited when one stops by. Here is a fledged vi video. It's about eight and a half. They always go to the bathroom before they fly. That's kind of, they want to be light, right? Get rid of excess weight. <laughs> And from a young age, the osprey know to poop off the nest to keep it clean. All right, we're going to fast forward this a little bit. <laughs> Thinking about it. <laughs> See how she's triangulating, right? It takes a lot of guts. <laughs> She was made for it. Woo. See how the mom is watching? And then I'm going to fast forward a little bit because she actually lands back on the nest, and you can see her first landing. It takes a lot of practice to land, but that was, that was okay. <laughs> she aimed for her mom. Um, so after that, after the fledging, the chicks will venture further and further away from their nest, learning their surroundings, and then they'll start their migration around 100 days. Um, migration is instinctual and solo. So one day, the chick is going to be, okay, I'm going to fly south, and that's all, all she wrote. Um, they can fly up to 2,500 miles one way, uh, I think the, the record was 30, almost 3,400 miles. So these, these are very hardy birds that can fly this, this far. Um, their sites such as ospreytracks.com, run by Rob Beauregard. He's an amazing ornithologist. He tracks the osprey, and you can see during migration where, where they are. Sometimes they get lost, they turn around, um, and sometimes they just fly straight there. And it's amazing how fast that these, mi these migrations can happen. Within a week, they can be at their wintering grounds. And usually, when they find a, a wintering ground, they always return to the same one. So there are creatures of habit. A cool fact is chicks usually do not catch their first fish until they migrate. Uh, that's because the dad is providing all the fish for them. So why would they have to learn? Um, and they're not taught by their parents. So it's all purely instinct. 
these animals run off of instinct. Um, survival rates, I will say, is about 50% after they fledge. So after migration, they get into their, the juveniles are in the wintering grounds. Um, what's gonna happen is they're gonna change their plumage. They're gonna go to the adult osprey color. They're gonna lose the buff tip and their eyes are gonna turn yellow. Um, young osprey will stay in their winter grounds for two to three years before returning to their natal grounds. Males are actually more likely to return closer to their natal nest than females. Uh, and the reason why they return is they wanna start a family. They wanna start breeding. Uh, it does take them um, a couple of tries uh, and it takes them about three to five years of age for them to do that. Osprey can live up to 25 years. So if they're successful every year, they can raise, you know, three to four babies a year or two to three, ba two to three babies a year. So that's hopefully continuing on the species. So I wanna end with the future of ospreys. There's a couple things that we as humans can do and a couple things that are working, scientists are working on right now. Uh, osprey are not threatened, they're not endangered in any way. The populations are continuing to increase. Uh, as nests are more successful, so, are the, so is the population. Um, osprey are very sensitive to their ecosystem. So I don't know if you guys know, the, uh, in 1960s there was DDT, a pesticide that was widely used. Uh, what that did is made the eggs very brittle and they broke. So DDT was banned by the government and then osprey rebounded. So did eagles and a bunch of other raptors. So currently scientists are studying mercury levels in fish and even radiation levels to see how it affects osprey. And what we can learn from that is when we're eating fish as well, we might see, we might connect with them. We might see, okay, well, if an osprey is sick from eating this fish, we can be sick from eating this fish. Right. Um, another thing is osprey are notorious for trash collecting. They like to bring ball and twine to the nest. They like to bring um, all sorts of trash, just recycling, so, you know, everyday things that we can do um, to help prolong the osprey lives. Um, osprey have adapted to be being around humans, you know, making sure that we're not disturbing nests if we want to see them. Um, there are boundaries set by U.S. Fish and Wildlife in order to view the nest. Um, and then also monitoring the pollution and habitat loss can be very important for ospreys, to continuing on ospreys for a long time. Um, and then I just wanted to note this picture over here is a female that visits the nest every year and she has an injured eye, which is why her eyes are two different colors. So I just wanted to show you something that could happen uh, we don't know. We don't know what happened to her, but um, injuries can happen, and they can survive with an injury, an eye injury, and she's proven it time and time again. So I want to end with questions. I want to thank you for your time. I want to thank you guys for listening to me and my passion for ospreys. I hope that each and every one of you has learned something today, and. Uh, we got some laughs, and he's winking at you right here. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Okay, so we're going to take a few questions now, and we ask that you raise your hand, and we'll call on you, and then we will actually bring the microphone to you. You have to keep the microphone near your mouth. It won't come in through the speaker, but this is for the folks at home, so they can hear your question. You want me to call? Okay. So when they couple up and then migrate, do they migrate together? They do not. So they just rendezvous back at the nest and start the next group. Do they all leave? Yes, they do. Yes, they're all solo. Mm -hmm. Okay, so <laughs> when they're down in uh, the warmer climes, they're just hanging out as individuals? And yep, just vacation home. I mean, they, they have it made. <laughs> and when they migrate <laughs> two and a half thousand miles, do they do it in one shot or do they always have to follow the it depends. Some do just fly straight there, and there's or within seven days they're they re, they are at their w wintering grounds. Some will stop off at other nests or even rivers and stuff, and take a longer period to migrate. And if they're going down there and staying there for 
three to five years during the month of warmer climates. Why well, bother coming back? Why not just make the most of it? It's uh because of the climate. So, I dunno if you know about the Amazon River, you know, it swells and it goes down. And then migrant osprey actually, they distribute themselves m- more and they have a better survival rating. If if that makes any sense. So, if, how do I explain this? I'm sorry. <laughs> um um had it i had it they spread out yeah they spread out it's more it's better for them to be migrants um and their population will vary more but then it'll, the population will be bigger because they're in a wider area so if they come back north if they come back north mm-hmm. and spread themselves out of the greater correct, area correct correct and i would mention that the caribbean island ospreys they don't uh have as many babies as the migrant osprey do because there's dangers of migrating and the Caribbean island population stays like this where all the other migrant population will go like this depending on weather conditions and and other factors so the northern when the nor- northern ones come go south they're actually flying over the top of the guys who live in the caribbean sometimes um i have heard uh, and i've read in a couple books that the osprey will avoid migrant osprey areas and go other in another area mm-hmm. thank you Good question. Yeah. So they go to like the Bahamas and stuff because I've seen them there. They do. They do. They go through Mexico, Central America, South America. They can, they can go any of those places. Is there any similarities between different birds and um, offsprays? Um. Well. When the same migrants from North America are migrating down to South America, those are the same ospreys. But the osprey in the Caribbean, they're a little different. Uh, they're a different subspecies. They have a white head, and they're a little smaller than the North American ospreys. What are, wha- how did ospreys get their name? That's a good question. So it actually came from ancient French and it's from bone breaker um, and they thought that the osprey would drop bones and the bones would break so that's kind of where osprey came from it's old french mm-hmm. way in the back i might be taking you too literally but in your description of the male versus the female i'm um I'm puzzled by the fact that the talons are the same size for the male and female. If the males are really the fishermen, it just seems like it could be an interesting adaptation or a way to differentiate between the males and the females. That's a good question. So the legs are actually a little thicker on a female, and that's uh, that's another way. But it's really hard. Talons are as fishermen. Correct, correct. And not all osprey talons are the same exact size. They vary because there's bigger osprey and smaller osprey. I haven't measured a lot of osprey talons, but that's a good observation. Maybe we can look into that. Mm -hmm. Um, Did you have a question here? I was just wondering, are they still still at the side? Oh, there you go. Yeah, thank you. (laughs) Microphone. (laughs) Thank you. When we initially saw the osprey picking up the fish. Yes. Uh, the one in particular with the very large fish, would that have been, if you were feeding himself, would that have been a snack or dinner or for the whole day and his wife? Or That's probably for the whole family. Um, usually the, uh, the, that's a really good question. Usually the male osprey will, excuse me, eat the head of the fish and then bring it back to the nest. As you can tell in some of the other videos, you saw like a headless fish. Um, that's because the, the, the floppy fish can hurt chicks and stuff like that. We don't want them to get injured. And then the nutrients in the head is actually really good. He's doing all the fishing. He's doing a lot of energy. He's going to eat the head of the fish and then bring it to the nest when he's done. Mm-hmm. We've got enough for a couple more couple questions. questions. Okay, right here in the green. Okay, so it sounds like the osprey is the only species in its genus. Correct. Right? Mm-hmm. What other genera are in the family? That's it. Yeah. Yeah. Or is it in one genus in the family? It's one genus, one species, okay. four subspecies. All right. Yes. So can you back up back further up from to family? Um, 
just curious, like how far back in the lineage you have to go to its closest relative? You know, that's a good question, and I do not know the answer to that. So that is a very good question. But Pandione, oh, I'm sorry. Pandione is the class, or the family, I'm sorry. Um, I think Pandione, they're the only one in there as well. Uh -huh. But except the acceptors, there's the Cooper's Hawk, there's other um, acceptors out there. Right, mm -hmm. right. Sharp mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yep. And I think that might have been a flounder, mm -hmm. that the fish, uh, the diving, the wet dive yeah. was the flounder. And then on another chart, you had some other fish like pike. Mm -hmm. What other fish do they eat? They eat all sorts of different, th I think over 80 species have been recorded that they eat both saltwater and freshwater. They're going to catch whatever fish they can. I know some osprey prefer trout or um, bass over flounder because flounder is kind of tough. Um, but yeah, anything that they can get. Mm -hmm. Good question. Maybe one more question. One more question. Uh, in yeah. the back, yes. You guys have some good questions tonight. <laughs> <laughs> we have a pair of osprey in Woody Creek that has tried for three summers to build a nest mm -hmm. unsuccessfully, mm. and I'm wondering how easily they give up. I mean, would, is there a chance they'll keep trying? They will keep trying. It's, it's in their instincts to breed. So maybe they won't be in that particular spot anymore and they'll choose a different nesting area, but they will continue to try. If there is a bonded pair and they just don't have a nest, they will, they will build a nest on top of a light pole. I've seen it on top of a, a dead tree, even a rock, you know, like on a ledge. I've seen it on a ledge as well. But if you have a platform, hopefully, that will attract them. But what attracts them mostly is if the nest is kind of already there. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, it's been blown away. Oh, they have to rebuild. So that's tough. They're going to yeah. have to rebuild the nest and then try to start a family then. Mm -hmm. <laughs> one more question right here? OK, okay. One, one more in this last one. <laughs> and this goes with the last question. Would that we've see that several areas in our valley we call it, we say that they need to play house for a few years mm -hmm. would that be a reason that the nest is not stable that they wouldn't really well have eggs it takes practice to become a parent so even if they have a nest structure and they have an actual nest um, it's going to take practice on incubation and feeding um, most likely they won't be successful within their first couple of years. Uh, it will t uh, sometimes the female will feed one chick and then the other chicks will pass away, unfortunately. Um, but once they get it, they're just going to, they're going to be pros at it. And those are the ones that you want to observe. And those are the ones that are going to prolong the species. But, but yeah, it takes the practice. <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm.